Thank you, Mark. Always a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm going to sort of set the foundation anatomically and functionally so that the rest of the rest of the session will make some sense. Where is the advance button? Oh, here it is. Yeah, okay, thanks. So let's just basically cover a little bit of the mitral valve anatomy. Um, we know that the mitral valve and aortic valve are intimately related through the fibrous trigone, uh, the fibrous trigone of the uh, 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 mitral valve anatomy representing the major portion of the anterior leaflet that most people believe does not really become a part of the dilatory process that occurs with uh, um, cardiomyopathies. If you look at the uh, aortic valve, you've got the aortic, aortomitral curtain at the top. Again, fibrous portion. Uh, some people believe doesn't need to be supported when we do a repair. The posterior medial trigone and anterior later, lateral trigone uh, represent the edges uh, of the anatomic location where a band would need to be inserted if just a posterior band is being used. And that's the portion of the uh, atrium uh, that will dilate of the annulus. During systole, there's a 20 to 30 percent reduction in the orifice area, and the annulus is also displaced apically, and that measurement of how far apically can be an estimate of ejection fraction and the contractility strength of the ventricle. Annular contractility uh, also facilitates uh, valve competency to some degree. So as far as the mitral valve goes, we've got the chordae tendineae in their primary or secondary cords, the primary uh, go to the leading edge, and the secondary cords insert on the ventricular surface of the leaflet and uh, are important for valvular ventricular interaction. The ter tertiary or basal cords extend from the posterior wall uh, of the ventricle to the posterior leaflet, and some people believe is important to maintain in to minimize risks of AV guru disruption if we're doing mitral valve procedures. Mitral valve repair. Uh, was essentially popularized back in 1983 when uh, Alain Carpentier was the honored guest speaker at the AATS meeting uh, that year and essentially presented how to do it, uh, how to do mitral valve repair. And it had been dabbled with up to that point, but he was the one who essentially changed the way we practice. And uh, he summarized in a, in a recent uh, text that he wrote with uh, David Adams all of his techniques that had developed over the years. The important thing to look at when talking about the mitral valve is the pathophysiological triad, and that includes the etiology, lesions, and dysfunction. And that'll be essentially what we talk about throughout the rest of the session. Etiology is essentially the cause of the disease. Lesions are what result from the disease, and dysfunction is what results from the lesions. So we're trying to uh, fix the dysfunction that is a consequence of the lesions that occur because of the etiology. So etiology is important because it helps us establish preoperative and postoperative medical therapy, expected com complexity of repair, and is the most important predictor of long-term prognosis. Uh, primary causes of uh, etiologic dysfunction, congenital, inflammatory, degenerative, secondary, are due to more, more often uh, dilatation of the mitral annulus itself. So the classification of mitral regurgitation has become commonplace, but always good to look at before we're going to talk about it uh, in detail. Number one is normal leaflet motion. That's generally due to dilation of the annulus. The leaflets move normally, but they do not coapt. Type two is excessive leaflet motion, and we can get that from uh, prolapse of the leaflet, uh, which is a primary leaflet problem, or rupture of the cords uh, that causes prolapse. Three is restricted leaflet motion. That can be uh, two forms. One is the rheumatic form uh, where the leaflets don't move well, and the other is the ischemic form, which is a consequence mainly of function of the ventricle wall. So when we look at the functional anatomy of the mitral valve, there's five areas that we need to focus on. The annulus, leaflets, chordae, tendineae, <laughs> papillary muscles, and the left ventricular wall. So let's go through these in order. Annular lesions can involve dilatation or calcification of the uh, uh, mitral valve annulus. Here's an example on the top of dilatation and an example of uh, a calcified annulus on the bottom. 
Essentially, you can have symmetrical dilatation that you might see with a dilated cardiomyopathy or asymmetrical dilatation, which you might see more often with an ischemic etiology. Here's an example of a patient, 64-year-old gentleman with atrial fibrillation, severe mitral regurgitation, normal leaflets. He had a mitral valve repair with a 29-millimeter band and a maze procedure, and we were able to fix this dilated annulus, get it back down to normal diameter, and eliminate the regurgitation. The basic options for using a ring, uh, the rigid ring is a complete circular ring, and that was the initial thing, that uh, initial ring that Carpentier proposed back in 1983, early 1980s. The semi-rigid ring generally has a more rigid anterior component and a little bit more flexible posterior component, although this band is one that ha maintains some rigidity. It's bendable, but maintains rigidity. The flexible rings are bands that were popularized by uh, Carlos Duran back at the same time when Carpentier was talking about his rigid rings. It uh, can either be a full band or full ring or a partial band, uh, also popularized uh, by uh, Toby Cosgrove at the Cleveland Clinic. Next, we want to look at uh, the leaflets and what needs to be, uh, how they can be addressed. What we need to do is segmental analysis, where we go from um, segment to segment, starting with a reference point, usually P1, then working our way around the rest of the segments to see which segments in particular are, are prolapsing and what needs to be addressed. Leaflet lesions can, inf can include a, a cleft or tear, vegetations or perforations, thickening or commissural fusion, and calcification and billowing, and billowing it not to be confused uh, with uh, prolapse. There are non-pathologic clefts, clefts that are normal to be in the leaflet. They generally are supported by cords and function like commissures to facilitate opening of the valve so we get a better orifice area. They do not extend all the way to the annulus, and uh, are, that makes them different from the pathologic uh, uh, form of cleft, which you can see here. One in the anterior leaflet up at the top, and one uh, here in the posterior leaflet uh, down at the bottom. And this creates a more complex uh, sort of a jet than the central jet we saw with the annular dilatation. And here you can see uh, initial attempt at repair with a suture placed at the free edges of this patient's uh, posterior leaflet cleft. Vegetations, perforations uh, can be a consequence of endocarditis or trauma. And here you can see on the, on the uh, left an endocarditic vegetation. Here following resection of the vegetation with reconstruction with a pericardial patch. That can be done if it's a very isolated area. And here we have a, a gentleman who presented with a uh, stroke, had uh, uh, endocarditis, uh, TEE sh showed vegetations, he had re uh, here, of which we can see here with um, fever and chills. He was treated with antibiotics for six weeks but recurred, and at surgery he was found to have these vegetations present on the leaflet. They were mainly focused on the posterior leaflet and were able to be fixed. Next, looking at thickening or commissure fusion, we can have it localized to one of the commissures, as in this example on the left, or double on the uh, anterior lateral and posterior medial commissures with fusion causing uh, stenosis and or regurgitation. Leaflet billowing can affect any of the uh, segments of the leaflet, and a billowing valve without prolapse does not necessarily cause regurgitation. In order to have regurgitation, not in, oh, in addition to billowing leaflets, you also have to have elongation of the cords in order to cause the prolapse. So billowing, billowing in and of itself looks abnormal to the eyeball, but does not necessarily cause much regurgitation, and this is as we may see with the Marfan syndrome. Billowing with cordal elongation, though, will uh, create mitral regurgitation. Next, we have a leaflet fibrosis with a restricted motion. Here we can see the posterior leaflet not moving well at all, and so there's malcoaptation with a big area of a, a jet, and here is an example of uh, measuring the regurgitant fraction, and this patient was measured out at 47 percent, quite extensive. This was also associated with increased left ventricular cavity size. And here we, go, uh, here we can see the posterior leaflet and the anterior leaflet. Anterior leaflet looks quite normal, posterior leaflet looks thickened and following repair with a 28-millimeter uh, band, 
the, uh, the annulus was uh, brought together to essentially make the orifice closure of the consequence of the anterior leaflet, not the posterior leaflet. So if we look at the spectrum of degenerative disease, we've got fibroelastic deficiency, which is a form of myxomatous change. And it can be localized with just a ruptured cord with a normal leaflet. Here we have a fibroelastic elastic deficiency plus, as it's referred to, and that's where we have not only a rupture cord, but prolapse and abnormalities in the leaflets themselves. The form frost and Barlow's are more extensive involvement with more than just one segment being involved in the disease process. Next, let's look at cordal t the corded tintinia, elongation, rupture, thickening, fusion, and shortening. Uh, elongation, rupture, and thickening, fusing, fusion, or shortening can affect any of the cords. Most often, uh, more often, it affects the posterior leaflet, and we can have cordal rupture and or cordal elongation, the either consequence of which will be regurgitation. And here we have an example of prolapsing with an elongated cord with a jet uh, headed behind the anterior leaflet, uh, uh, demonstrating a posterior leaflet abnormality, and then following repair elimination of the regurgitation. This patient had P2 prolapse without rupture, resection and a band was able to uh, fix that abnormality. Here we have again a flail, that's with a ruptured cord, jet going behind the anterior leaflet, here following repair with good coaptation and elimination of regurgitation. This was a patient that had P2 prolapse and you can see the cord ruptured uh, extending beyond the annular plane, uh, which was in contrast to the last patient who had only prolapse without a ruptured cord. Here's a flail P3, again with a ruptured cord, the jet going behind the anterior leaflet and following, uh, and you can see right here the abnormality in 3D, right near the uh, uh, P3 region of the uh, uh, valve. And following a limited triangular resection with a uh, 32 millimeter band and an Alfieri stitch, the regurgitation was eliminated with good coaptation. In the form for us is more extensive disease, and here we can see it in multiple segments, uh, two different jets, uh, both affecting the uh, posterior leaflet, though. This patient had prolapse of all the leaflets with a functional double cleft. A quadrangular P2 resection, and a, uh, a sliding plasty, which I'm sure Dr. Borgia will talk about in a little bit, um, the techniques of it, were able, were what was needed to focus on this disease. And, and the issue is you have to look at, like I said earlier, you have to look at each segment and analyze each segment of the leaflet by itself because for each lesion you have to have an independent repair. Next, the anterior leaflet prolapse, a bit more complicated. Should we consider transfer to a reference center? Here's a gentleman with anterior prolapse, essentially ruptured cord, and you can see that the, uh, here the anterior leaflet is prolapsing. Or bileaflet bi disease with P2 prolapse and A2 prolapse, you can see cre creating two separate jets, one from the anterior leaflet disease, one from the posterior leaflet disease. And following quadrangular section with, again, a sliding plasty and a cord, one, one uh, surgical technique for each lesion is the idea behind uh, repairing these more complex diseases. So each individually by itself is not complex, but when they added together, it becomes complex. Again, bileaflet prolapse with multiple jets. That one stopped running. But here we go. Interoperatively, again, we need to do a segmental analysis, look at all the different segments of the leaflet, and here we do it. we're going to do a triangular P1 resection. You can see the jet over uh, near P1, and then following repair with a uh, cord, uh, no more regurgitation. Postoperatively elimination of the regurgitation. And a cord with leaflet fibrosis. Again, a 72-year-old uh, woman, severely debilitated. Uh, in, in, in the, the, exa the reason I show this case is because this is a complex repair, very restricted leaflets, intraoperatively very thickened, 
Should we do a re repair? Well, it depends on the complexity of the thickening. This patient had rigidity of both the uh, subvalvular apparatus as well as the leaflets. And in this particular case, we did a valve replacement and uh, uh, efficiently, and the patient did very well. So we don't have to repair every single patient. Um, we have to, uh, but in the majority, uh, that's the focus. A couple of quick last things, papillary muscle rupture. Here we can see a uh, papillary, the uh, prolapse of the leaflet and uh, with severe, very severe regurgitation. This is a patient who had an acute myocardial infarction. Uh, and then following repair with reconstruction of that cord and uh, papillary muscle, no regurgitation. So you have to identify the pathology and focus on it. And finally, left ventricular wall is generally due to dyskinesis. Here's one that uh, it looks like it's fairly normal there, but we got severe regurgitation. And, uh, and essentially all that needed was a, a ring to uh, decrease annular diameter and eliminate the regurgitation. Finally, combination lesions. You can have more than just involvement of uh, one of the uh, portions of the mitral valve apparatus. Here's one that involved both the leaflets and the left ventricular wall. It was a 76-year-old woman. She had a P2 resection, a 31 millimeter band for what looked like standard prolapse, but I don't know why the bottom one isn't playing, but coming off pump, she still had severe mitral regurgitation. And I thought to myself, why in God's name is that? But then as we looked closer, we saw she also had posterior wall dysfunction that we did not appreciate on the initial uh, echocardiogram. And so what we did was removed her true sized flexible band and placed a downsized ring and eliminated the regurgitation. So it, it, that case demonstrated the importance of reassessment and reevaluating your own work. And if it's not perfect, trying to figure out why exactly uh, it ended up that way and how to fix it. So the goals of valve assessment are to establish a precise diagnosis, pre-op echo, then intra-op, and post-repair, determine the most appropriate treatment option, uh, one uh, repair technique for each lesion, consider transfer to a, a reference center if, uh, if it's a complex lesion you are not familiar with or your partners are not familiar with uh, dealing with, and uh, do a segmental valve analysis, go from region to region, look at each leaflet segment uh, so we don't miss disease processes. Thank you very much.